Today on Strong Diagnosis, I'll be discussing clinical prediction rules. To demonstrate how they are used, I'll be intermittently referring to a case of a woman with a possible PE throughout the video. Let me introduce the case. This is a 65-year-old woman with a past medical history of hypertension and breast cancer, currently undergoing chemotherapy, who is now presenting with the abrupt onset of right-sided pleuritic chest pain and non-positional shortness of breath one hour ago. She has no other symptoms. On exam, she is afebrile, pulse is 110, blood pressure is 110 over 85, respiratory rate 24, and O2 sat is 95% on room air. She has an elevated JVP and bibasilar crackles. On labs, her white count is 12 and her troponin is undetectable. On chest x-ray, she has a small right-sided pleural effusion. Last, her ECG shows sinus rhythm with mild, nonspecific ST and T changes. The questions we're going to tackle for her in this video, from the available information, can we rule in a pulmonary embolism? If not, what should be the next test ordered? If a pulmonary embolism is ruled in, should she be admitted to the hospital? To answer these questions, we could make an educated guess based on our experience and knowledge of pulmonary embolisms. We call that making decision by clinician gestalt. There's nothing wrong with that. It's how the overwhelming majority of medical decisions are made in real life. Or alternatively, we could use a clinical prediction rule. These are tools which identify and quantify the contributions of the most helpful pieces of information related to a specific clinical scenario and reduce them to an algorithm or simple scoring system to help predict the probability of either a specific diagnosis, benefit from a specific treatment, or an adverse outcome. These pieces of information can be features of a patient's demographic, such as age and sex, a patient's current symptoms, their medical history, exam findings, or test results. There are a variety of alternative names for clinical prediction rules, or for their subtypes, such as risk scores, decision rules, probability assessments, severity indices, scoring systems, and risk stratification tools. While there is some variability in how these terms are used in practice, I think it's helpful and appropriate to use the term clinical prediction rule as an umbrella term that includes all of these others. The development of a clinical prediction rule has four stages. First, they are derived from multivariate statistical methods that identify the set of useful independent pieces of data and their relative weights. In order for a piece of data to be useful, it needs to not only be predictive, but also needs to discriminate between those with and without the diagnosis or outcome of interest. It also needs to be relatively common within the population in which the rule will be applied. Otherwise, if it included every predictive piece of data, no matter how rare, the clinical prediction rule would easily become too unwieldy to be practical. The rule is then validated using a separate data set to ensure that the initially determined predictive variables were not a statistical anomaly. Even for successfully validated rules, the validation data set often demonstrates less predictive accuracy than the derivation data set, which is to be expected and does not necessarily mean that mistakes were made along the way. Validation should be followed by an impact analysis to see if the clinical prediction rule actually improves patient outcomes and or reduces cost in real world situations. However, this has not yet been done for many, possibly even most rules currently in use. The final stage is implementation in which a validated and impactful rule sees widespread adoption in clinical practice. Clinical prediction rules that use scoring systems are often incorporated into diagnostic algorithms or flowcharts that further simplify the cognitive burden for a clinician making decisions at the bedside. So now, let's return to our patient and tackle the first question. Can we rule in a pulmonary embolism? The reason I chose a PE to demonstrate clinical prediction rules is because their use as both a diagnostic and prognostic tool is particularly common with this diagnosis. The most widely used of these is the WELL score for PE, 
not to be confused with the similar Well score for DVT. The Well score for PE scores seven individual features of the presentation. These features include a clinical gestalt that a PE is the single most likely diagnosis, signs and or symptoms of a DVT, a heart rate above 100, a previous history of PE and or DVT, recent immobilization, hemoptysis, and active malignancy. A patient's well score can range from 0 to 12.5, although we could consider a continuous range of probabilities along that range of scores, instead what is done is that the patient is assigned to one of several risk categories. Although some use a total of two risk categories for the well score, with a cutoff of less than four for the lower category, I personally prefer a three-tiered approach. If the patient has zero to one points, they are low risk, meaning a PE probability of approximately 2%. If the patient has a score of two to six, they have a moderate risk, meaning a probability around 15%. And if the patient has a score above six, they are at high risk with a PE probability of about 43%. A lot can be said about the well score. For one thing, it is very unusual among clinical prediction rules that Gestalt is incorporated. After all, clinical prediction rules are supposed to replace Gestalt. But when the original authors of the well score derived the independent predictors, they found that clinical Gestalt was really important in this case. It would be fascinating to see if this finding still held up now, 20 years later, or if clinicians as a group have since so internalized the other predictive factors from the well score and the relative weights into their Gestalt that Gestalt itself is no longer as much an independent factor. But as far as I know, that hasn't been done yet. Returning to our patient, what is her well score? There is one point for having breast cancer, 1.5 points for her heart rate of 110, and in my opinion, based on the fact that I wrote this case, I believe that PE is the single most likely diagnosis, which gives her three more points for a total of 5.5, placing her in the moderate risk category. So what do we do with this information? To answer the initial question of whether we can rule in a PE at this point, with a PE probability of about 16%, we clearly cannot. The second post question was what should be the next test ordered? As with many clinical prediction rules, we can use the score within the context of a published algorithm that will help us here. With PEs, there are dozens upon dozens of published diagnostic algorithms. For example, here is one from up-to-date circa 2014 that incorporated the two-tiered approach to the well score. However, I prefer this algorithm for diagnosing PEs taken from my own video on this diagnosis. In this algorithm, we calculate the well score here. It was within the two to six range which means the next test to order is a blood test called a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is normal, a PE has been ruled out. If it's elevated, one should proceed with a CT pulmonary angiogram. If, on the other hand, the patient's well score was more than six, they would have a high enough pretest probability for PE that a negative D-dimer would not result in a low enough post-test probability to rule it out. So in this case, the D-dimer step is skipped altogether. Likewise, if the well score is less than two, the patient has a low enough pretest probability that they might not even need a D-dimer or CT scan at all, depending on the PERC rule, which is an altogether different PE-related clinical prediction rule. This has been just one example of using clinical prediction rules. There are hundreds of such rules, though most clinicians typically use just a small subset of these that are most relevant to their own practice. For instance, here are some of the clinical prediction rules that I use most frequently as a hospitalist. You'll notice that they are divided into three categories based on whether they are used to establish a diagnosis, to help with a treatment decision, or to provide prognosis. But these divisions are artificial as many rules can be applied in more than one way. For example, the pneumonia severity index which is often used in making a decision as to whether a patient presenting with pneumonia should be admitted to the hospital and given IV rather than oral antibiotics, has that role because it's predictive of which patients are more likely to have a poor outcome. Similarly, the CHADS-2 and CHADS-VASC scores, 
are used to guide decisions about anticoagulation in patients with atrial fibrillation because they predict risk of stroke. We still have the third and final question to answer about our patient who may have a PE. If one is ruled in using the previously discussed algorithm, should she be admitted to the hospital? For this, as you may have seen in the previous table, there's yet another clinical prediction rule, the PE severity index, which places patients into one of five risk categories for 30-day mortality. If we look at which clinical features she has, she gets 65 points for her age, 30 points for her history of cancer, and 20 points for her heart rate of 110. This gives her 115 points overall. The PE severity index predicts her to have a 4 to 11% risk of death within 30 days, which by conventional practice, at least for PEs, that means she should be admitted to the hospital for observation. This was just one example of how one might employ clinical prediction rules in practice. Their advantages in general include a reduction in the need for clinicians to make burdensome biostatistical calculations, which are honestly rarely done in practice. They identify and help clinicians to remember the most predictive features of diagnoses and clinical situations. For example, a familiarity with the WELLS score will remind a clinician of the importance of PE risk factors like malignancy, immobility, and prior venous thromboembolism, even if they don't dogmatically apply the prediction rule to every relevant patient. Clinical prediction rules are less prone to bias than conventional decision-making, and they standardize decision-making between different clinicians. In other words, they help to bring clinicians who are outliers in practice closer to the standard of care. However, they also have some significant disadvantages. For one, they exist for only a minority of diagnoses and clinical situations. They don't incorporate uncommon features of the diagnosis, even if strongly predictive. For example, the WELL score would not account for a patient's known hereditary thrombophilia or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Not all prediction rules are sufficiently validated or have been shown to improve outcomes. They can inadvertently incorporate biases from their original authors, biases which, over time, could sneak into the standard of care if the prediction rule becomes widely adopted. They can underperform relative to expert opinion. An example of this would be how expert opinion is more sensitive than the San Francisco syncope rule for identifying patients at high risk of adverse outcomes. And finally, algorithms based on clinical prediction rules do not take into account patient preferences or different risk tolerances. Overall, despite their name, clinical prediction rules should be viewed and used as guides more so than as strict rules that must be followed dogmatically. They're like clinical practice guidelines published by professional societies. They are meant to help clinicians maximize diagnostic accuracy and to practice at the standard of care, but there is never a requirement to follow them. If you think that your patient's specific situation does not apply to the relevant clinical prediction rule for whatever reason, you should not feel compelled to use it. Today's key takeaways. Clinical prediction rules are tools which identify and quantify the contributions of the most helpful pieces of information related to a clinical scenario and reduce them to an algorithm or simple scoring system to help determine a patient's diagnosis, treatment, and or prognosis. They reduce cognitive burden and help to standardize diagnostic workups and management decisions. Clinical prediction rules exist for only a minority of diagnoses and have several important limitations. And last, clinical prediction rules should be primarily used as a guide rather than strict rules that must be followed.